All right, welcome everyone. My name is Ryan Westcott, and I'm here today to talk about my research towards developing a fully reusable small scale launch vehicle, or rocket booster, as many people would call it. So, I want to start out with talking about the why. Why do we want to build a smaller reusable launch vehicle? And the first part has to do with what's going on in rocket reusability today in the industry. So, traditionally, when we launch something into space, we launch it on a very big uh, rocket with multiple stages or strap on boosters. And when those stages or boosters are expended or out of fuel, they detach from the rocket and either burn up in the atmosphere or crash into the ocean. And this is extremely wasteful and especially uh, very economically unviable because every time we want to launch something into space, we have to destroy our entire rocket just to get there. And that makes space access really expensive. And one of the reasons why 2001 A Space Odyssey still hasn't happened in 2020. Um, so about 10 years ago, some engineers and entrepreneurs and researchers got together and they said, hey, what if we built some systems to land these stages so that we can fly them again? And so far, that's working great at the very large orbital scale. This right here is a $60 million massive booster that has just delivered its payload into orbit, and now it's coming back down to land, ready to be um, reused. And these vehicles, like I said, are big, like Statue of Liberty size type of big. And that brings me to my next point. We are living in the age of technological miniaturization. Our phones are getting smaller, our computers are getting smaller, our microprocessors are getting smaller, and subsequently, a lot of our space payloads and satellites are also getting smaller. And that has led rise to a massive increase and a massive transformation in um, how we launch things into space and what we launch into space. So now, small rockets and small sat uh, launchers are absolutely booming. And this has just been a development in, in the past um, four or five years. It's very recent. And the problem is, is that we haven't yet applied this amazing reusable technology that's saving millions of dollars at the large scale to this new revolution of small boosters. So that led me to define my engineering goal. How can we take this amazing technology that's being applied to the very large boosters and scale it down to be used at the smaller scale? And that comes with many challenges. So um, to work towards this research goal, I went through about four major uh, iterative design cycles. That's where we uh, define our problem, build our solution, test it, figure out what doesn't work, and go back around again. So I'm going to quickly go over the first two um, design cycles I went through so we can focus on the last two most important ones. So this, <laughs> I hate looking at this because this just shows how far um, I've been able to come through this research here. So initially, I thought, you know, if uh, I build it at the model scale here, rocket comes up, comes down, we put boosters at the top of the rocket, it'll stabilize like a pendulum. Um, so I built uh, some quick uh, physics simulations in a spreadsheet, built a little flight computer out of Arduino, um, and I pulled it up with a drone and dropped it, and um, it failed terribly. Trust me, the, the, the flight did not look good. Um, and it turns out I fell for what's known as the rocket pendulum fallacy. And this is actually the same fallacy that Robert Gardner fell for when he was building the world's first liquid fueled rocket. Um, so then I realized that I needed an active control system, an active stabilization system. So I moved on to design number two. I designed a thrust vectoring mount, uh, fully designed from the ground up and 3D printed by myself. Um, and I thought, okay, if we just keep the motors parallel uh, or perpendicular to the ground, parallel with gravity, it'll stabilize, right? Turns out it doesn't. And I didn't know this at the time, but just running a proportional controller induces oscillations into a nonlinear system like this. Um, so I was kind of, you know, torn at this point. I was like, oh, this is frustrating. So I went out and read a ton of literature on this. These are just some of the articles here that I read. These are kind of my favorite ones here. And I learned about, you know, how is this being done at the large orbital scale? How do we control systems like this where we have to balance an inverted pendulum? And after reading um, a bunch of articles like this, I realized that I had to focus on two main things. I had to focus on active stabilization and building a robust system to be able to handle that. And I had to focus on being able to throttle down my propulsion system so that we can get that nice smooth landing that we achieve uh, with like the Falcon 9 booster that you saw earlier. And to do this, I focused on four main areas of my launch vehicle to achieve these two goals. So the first one was developing thrust vectoring hardware. So this right here is a novel propulsion system that I developed um, that uses a quad nozzle design to provide pitch, yaw, roll, and throttle control to the vehicle. And through my literature review, I've never seen any design like this um, ever produced before. 
So the way it works is there are four uh, solid fuel rocket motors situated around the uh, circumference of the airframe, and they vector each in one axis tangent to the circumference of the vehicle. So um, if we want to induce pitch or yaw to the vehicle, we can move um, uh, a J or, uh, opposite motors in the same direction, pitch and yaw. If we want to induce roll to the vehicle, we can uh, vector all motors in the same direction that induces roll. And what's really cool about this is that we can actually throttle down our system using solid fuel motors, which is a big advancement in the aerospace um, sector here. And the way we do that is we throttle each adjacent motor, or sorry, we vector each adjacent motor towards each other. And what we're doing there is we are canceling out the horizontal thrust component generated by that, and we are simply reducing the vertical thrust component. So using my design right here, we can vector down to about, or uh, throttle down to about 77% of the total thrust, which is awesome. So, um, of course, we need some way to control this vectoring mount. So I built a flight computer system running on M4 CPU at 180 megahertz. Um, built all the electrical hardware from the ground up here, um, including all the power supplies and electrical equipment to supply power to that vectoring mount and communicate with all the onboard sensors. And of course, we can have awesome hardware, but if we don't have software to control that hardware, it's just a rock. Um, so this equation right here is by far the most important equation in this entire project. This is the proportional integral derivative, or PID, control equation. And what it does is it takes in an air value, uh, denoted by E of T right here. It takes in three coefficients, the KP, KI, and KD values, as well as um, some readings for those. And what it does is it looks at the current state of the system, um, the, the current air away from vertical, because um, generally we want to keep the rocket pointy end up. Um, we look at how far we have been off of vertical in the past, and we look at how fast we're either approaching or devi deviating away from that vertical set point. And it creates an output value that we can then send to the vectoring mount after some transformations. So what's uh, interesting about PID is that you have to tune it out really well before, or else you will get an unstable system. So I built a physics simulation in MATLAB that uses a transfer function-based proportional integral derivative optimization algorithm to tune out those PID values for me after I input all the um, physical data about the object. And this simulation runs in two dimensions, so it, it simulates just one axis of the vehicle. Um, and then we need to test that somehow. So instead of dropping it and possibly just having the vehicle fly all over in the sky, I built a uh, hold down mount here that allows the vehicle to rotate about its center of mass, as it would when it's falling, and test the stabilization system. So after three of these trials, I was able to tune out those PIDs a little bit more after looking at the real world output of it. And then it was time to actually test it. So instead of going through the whole flight and uh, building a rocket that can go up and then land, I used a UAV to pull it up. And here was one of the landing tests there. So in this shot right here, you can see it's coming in at a bit of an angle and the stabilization algorithm corrects for it. But unfortunately, we run out of fuel a little too early uh, in this particular test right here. I did a total of four of these tests. And we were so close, we were just shouting for it. Uh, this is some of the data from those tests right there. And you can see that when we come down, there's something odd happening right here. As soon as the motors ignite, it starts to deviate away from vertical for some reason. And what's interesting about solid fuel rocket motors is that once you ignite them, they just burn. They, they go until they burn out of uh, fuel, unlike hybrid or liquid fuel rocket engines. And something that's hard with them is it's hard to ignite them at the exact same moment every single time. So when we have these motors situated um, about the circumference of the airframe and not directly in line with the center of mass, it starts to produce a, a moment arm on the vehicle and it starts to pitch or yaw in one direction. So that's the main thing that I learned from this design right here. It's really hard to ignite all those motors at the same time. So then I started the next design iteration about uh, four or five months after that last, uh, beginning the, the last one. And I realized I really just need to hammer down on the stabilization and the throttling and improve both of those. And I decided to do that through building a more robust simulation environment than the MATLAB environment and completely redesigning the hardware. Because having those motors um, around the outside of the vehicle is going to be very hard to ignite them all at the same moment. So here are some photos of the current uh, vehicle that uh, is in um, uh, iteration number four. 
And this is the first time that I am ever using a component that I did not design, develop, test from the ground up. And that is the new vectoring mount here. And in research, a lot of times you have to make that choice. You have to say, am I going to um, design something from the ground up, or am I going to um, uh, design it myself, or purchase it, sorry. Um, so those are some of the uh, pictures there. That's the new vehicle there with all the new hardware. And what I've done is developed a six degrees of freedom physics simulation of the landing vehicle from the ground up. And what this allows me to do is have super, super, super precise control over all aspects of it. And here I'm taking in a ton of data and simulating the landing process right here. And I can use the Zeigler Nicholas uh, PID tuning method to tune out this system in this environment right here. Uh, and this is what happens if you have your overtuned PIDs. That was my first attempt at tuning PIDs in here. And obviously we don't want that to happen in real life, so it's nice to happen in the software. Now, What's also uh, most important is being able to throttle down the system, because without throttling, you have to fly through a very specific flight regime to be able to land correctly. So I developed an algor algorithm called bimodal cosine throttling, and it's uh, a novel algorithm that increases the flight envelope of where we can ignite the redshirt propulsion system. Because at this scale right here, we have to fly through that little point to land precisely, but with my bimodal um, uh, cosine throttling algorithm, we only have to fly through that big regime right there, that flight regime, in order to land precisely. And the way it works is by uh, converting the vertical thrust component into a horizontal thrust component in the first phase of the landing burn, and then in the last phase of the landing burn, throttling back up to full thrust to land. So just to conclude, we have flight-proven mechanical hardware, we have flight-proven electrical hardware, we've developed a real-time operating system from the ground up to operate on these vehicles, a robust simulation environment, and the world's first ever computational proof that we can so throttle down a solid-fueled rocket vehicle and land with that so uh, throttling algorithm. So hopefully, with my research and the research of a lot of these other amazing people, we can one day have less expensive and more reliable space access. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah? If you were to put it into a spin position first, when all your motors ignite, or your motors ignite in any particular order, mm -hmm. um, and then into a vertical configuration, would that help the stability? Uh, spin on the roll axis? Yeah, so you want to spin on a vertical axis this way. Uh huh. So, um, yeah, um, that so that ha that is sort of a double-edged sword there because if we spin on the roll axis, uh, our vehicle is less inclined to pitch and yaw. But it also becomes much more difficult for our active stabilization system to adjust to those new parameters. Because our, if we're spinning like this, and we want to correct to vertical, we're constantly going to have to be changing that, um, that uh, stabilization vector at the same rate that our vehicle is spinning. So it, it, it would help initially, but it would also be more difficult for our active stabilization system to bring it back to vertical. Yeah? Uh, I think you alluded to this fact. but. Liquid propulsion is so easy to control, and the landing back is a very precise mechanism compared to going up. Mm -hmm. Very drastic. Uh, why if we marry to the solid booster and, and inherit all those problems and use the liquid propulsion to come down? Yeah, so um, what this research here is focusing on is it's really focusing on the small scale, because we have this massive space revolution right now with these smaller launch vehicles. And it's also especially focused at sounding vehicles, which use solid propulsion on the way up. So if we add a liquid propulsion system for descent, that is adding an immense amount of complex, uh, complexity to this whole system. Because we're going to need hundreds, if not hundreds of thousands of components to run these liquid-fueled engines, whereas we would have just a very simple one, maybe two components of a, uh, of a, a thrust chamber if we were, solid, uh, if we were using solid fuel. Solid propulsion, the main advantage is no leakage and that type of Exactly. It, it, it's, it's almost foolproof. And in this, I'm always thinking about how can we reduce the number of components? Because every time you add a component, you're adding one more thing that can fail on this vehicle and cause a catastrophic failure. So if we can reduce that down, you know, one of the, the benefits of this uh, second uh, propulsion system here is that it's, it's just one, one motor. And uh, all the throttling is software defined. Whereas in the previous design, we, all the throttling was hardware defined. We were, let's see, where is it? We're actually turning these motors 
to, to achieve the throttling. So moving that to software reduces a bunch of this complexity and uh, really makes for a more uh, robust system. Yeah? So based on your fourth iteration simulation, yeah. so you expect this new design to be successful. When are you going to actually test it? Next weekend. <laughs> um, so this, this is an ongoing project here. Uh, I've been working on this for about the past year. And uh, you know we live in Oregon, so weather permitting, it's uh, it's hard to carry out these trials. Sometime here, we you know we had to wait for a, a good clear day because um, not all components in this system, especially all the, the electrical components that were developed, you know, really from scratch from the ground up, those need a, a good environment to uh, to be flown in. And I'm just curious, the actual construction is something that you're 3D printing? Or yes. Um, so uh, all the components in here, except for the just two parts in the new thrust vectoring mount that I mentioned. All those components I have uh, designed from the ground up in Fusion 360, gone through all the testing procedures, 3D printed them myself, um, and then tested them and implemented them. And I, I didn't have any uh, mentors or anything of this. Uh, this was all just kind of learning from reading papers and YouTube videos. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I like the latest reiteration of this, but what about um, any accounting for any uh, atmospheric changes that you wouldn't expect, like wind shear, um, currents, things like that, how quickly will it be able to adjust and sense those changes? Yeah, exactly. So this right here is the, the flight envelope. So we yeah. this is the altitude, and as we come in, you know, our, our vehicle is dropping in altitude and we're increasing in velocity. So, you know, if, if we went with the traditional design here, where we have to fly through this one yeah, little point pinhole. right here, yeah, yeah, it's very hard when we have all those environmental <laughs> factors, which are incredible, like, you know, always impacting it. Here, this, you get through the majority of your flight, and this only goes to 100 meters, this, this vehicle could go much higher, um, and you get through this entire flight, and your, the basket that you want to shoot into is much larger. So it can account for everything above that. And uh, once we get down below you know, uh, 25 meters here or so, there's much less of those uh, environmental impacts. And the, those small changes below that altitude, those could be uh, accounted for with uh, cold gas thrusters or nitrogen thrusters, things like uh, what the Falcon 9 uses for attitude right. control. And, and on its descent for these, low, for these lower um, launches, uh -huh. at what point do these need to kick in? Yeah, so there's a few different ways that this could work. Uh, for example, on the Falcon 9, everything is done with, with uh, retropropulsion. There's no aerodynamic braking with it, um, and that uses a lot of fuel. So one of my ideas here is that uh, we can combine with uh, aerodynamic braking. So one design proposal from Rocket Lab for their new Electron rocket is that they will deploy um, basically a, a big parachute, but it, it acts as a drag brake. And what they're trying to do is deploy that big drag uh, chute, take a boat out in the ocean, fly a helicopter off the boat, and pick up the falling rocket with a helicopter. Now there are so many components in that system, and when we're, when we're trying to reduce things, that, that's a nightmare right there. Um, so what this is doing is we could work with that parachute where the parachute slows its descent enough, mm -hmm. and then just um, you know for a, a small sat launch vehicle, maybe um, uh, 500 meters, maybe 750 meters above ground level, then it initiates that propulsion system for that soft touchdown right at the end. Awesome. Thank you, Thank you so much.